Welcome to the MakerBots and Evercore presentation called MLP, M&A, and IDR Restructuring Trends. My name is Josh Davidson. I had the capital markets and MLP practice at Baker Bots. Joining me today are Mike Bresson, who heads the MLP tax practice at Baker Bots, and Ray Strong, who's the senior managing director at Evercore and who works on <clears throat> many of these types of transactions. For questions during or after the program, please email Natalie Pruitt. Her email address is N-A-T-A-L-I-E dot P-R-E-W-I-T-T -T at BakerBots dot com. This program has been approved for one hour of Texas and California CLE credit participatory and New York CLE credit for one hour professional practice transitional and non-transitional. Later on during the presentation, I will be reading the CLE ID number that you will need for submission for credit. A recording of the webinar will be circulated in the next few days and will be posted to the firm website at www.bakerbots.com. Today's agenda <clears throat> involves first a little bit of an MLP market update. What's going on with MLPs and what are factors <laughs> that um, in the industry that might be leading people to consider some sort of transaction that would restructure their incentive distribution rights. In the second part of the agenda, we'll talk about <clears throat> different, why, um, different types of simplifications. <laughs> the through mergers or otherwise. In the third part, we'll talk about tax consequences of these deals. And in the fourth, we'll talk about the committee, board, and unit holder processes to uh, evaluate, negotiate, and approve these transactions. I'm going to turn it over to Ray Strong for uh, an MLP market update. Great. Thanks, Josh. Again, Ray Strong, Evercore Partners. Um, as Josh mentioned, we'll give a little bit of overview on MLP market and hopefully some, some interesting slides and in getting to why we're talking about simplifications today. But uh, if you look on slide, slide five, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, trading performance, and um, we saw challenges in seven, 16 and now a bit of a rebound. We thought it was pretty interesting to note that whether you look at the Alarian Index, the S&P 500, or WTI, we really hit lows in that early February 2016. Lagging that somewhat is the rig count on the left-hand side, a low in May of 2016. But we've seen some pretty significant um, rebound, particularly in the, in the rig count and obviously WTI um, since that time. Flipping to the next page, capital markets have kind of reflected this trend. We peaked left-hand side of the page 2012 through 14, and that's all capital raised by MLPs, so it's at debt and equity. And then looking at the IPO market, we certainly peaked in 2014 with 18 MLPs, followed by seven in 15 and only one last year, Noble Midstream, and uh, one royalty trust this year so far. But as we'll mention a little bit later, we do see um, more activity and um, MLPs kind of on file. Now, with um, with the tough commodity prices, we saw a number of different uh, a number of distribution cuts. Um, page seven outlines this, and when we put this slide together, there are more companies on here than we had thought actually that went through uh, distribution cuts, whether through restructurings or IDR buyouts or just straight, um, given the commodity price environment, um, a number of distribution cuts, cuts across the board. Um, and when you factor that in and uh, the, the overall environment, if you turn to page eight, we put together a bit of a slide on MLP's cost of equity. Left-hand side was, if you look at the Alarian Index and kind of average out, and, and this is probably maybe a little bit more in the better performing uh, MLPs, a yield of 5%, and assume that uh, the MLPs into the 50% tier on their IDRs, 
and if the GP is taking about 30% of the overall cash flow, so 30% of the roughly 7.1% yield, um, so 5% going to the LP, 2.1% going to the GP, your all in cost of equity is about 7.1%. Today, however, the Alarian index is 7.8%. If you took the same assumption deep into the 50% splits, GP taking 30% of the cash flows, the cost of equity is 11.1%. That is on the higher end of what the MLPs are used to and has caused a little bit of disruption. So maybe all of this combined has perhaps increased merger activity. And what have we seen in merger activity? So we, we tried to kind of put boxes together for each transaction that could be a MLP merger with another MLP third party or an MLP buy-in by the sponsor, and we'll get into this in a lot more detail in just a sec. But, um, you know, the M&A market for MLPs was always difficult in the early 2000s. Uh, you really have four transaction parties here. You've got the LP on one side, the LP on the other side, and the GP on one side, and the GP on the other side. That's why we really didn't see much M&A activity at all in the, in the 2000s. Then, um, we saw a bit of GP IPOs, so the general partner going public, and then we saw simplifications where the GP take was um, getting higher uh, uh, for, for the cash flows, and <clears throat> companies said, well, I'll simplify, I'll buy in the GP, and I'll lower my cost of equity with a lot of um, CapEx still to spend, and it'll be better for my growth rate. That's where you see in that 2009, 2010, these simplification transactions. Then, then the market kind of said, all right, well, there's a tremendous amount of CapEx being spent in North America. I'll go ahead and, and continue on along my growth. Um, but then as we saw in, in kind of into 2015, that CapEx spend became less in North America, the growth became a bit more challenged, and perhaps the M&A activity increased as a result of that. And so we saw 10 deals in 14, 10 deals in 15, 8 in 16, two or three announced in 17 already, um, who should include uh, recently VTTI-BV announced the, the proposed acquisition of VTTI. Uh, the other thing that you've seen is uh, really most of these transactions prior to 2016 were all stock. Most all stock may be a sliver of cash, and today we're seeing more cash components um, into the uh, transactions like the Enbridge uh, Midcoast uh, transaction. So uh, a bit of a trend perhaps, and that's why we want to dive into these, what does it mean for an IDR and IDR simplifications? I'll turn them to Josh. So I'll pick up with a little bit of the process on IDR simplifications. So page 11 is just asking the basic question, why do people simplify in the first place? And on page 12, we kind of focus on two different situations, two successful MLP and the not successful enough MLP. The two successful MLP has a high cost of capital because the IDR take is so high that it makes it difficult or more difficult for a company to show sufficient accretion for a common unit holder. And a, a rather unsuccessful MLP is not in the high splits. Maybe they're not paying distributions to the full MQD uh, or at all. And so the IDRs really are, are not in the money and are, are acting as a, as a hindrance because if an MLP is there, you can't, uh, sorry, if an IDR is there, you can't increase the distribution to common unit holders without, uh, above the MQD without also paying to the IDRs. And one other point I will make about IDRs is that when you go issue additional common units, you're in effect issuing more IDRs. You don't actually issue more IDRs, but IDRs have a claim on the a percentage claim on the total cash flow. So when you have more common units at the same distribution level, the IDRs benefit from and, and get that additional distribution. I think most people listening in know the basic cash distribution policy of an MLP, so I will go over it somewhat quickly. But MLPs distribute cash quarterly, and they calculate the IDR take quarterly. 
IDRs are only paid from what we call operating surplus, which you can think of as cash from operations, so that's a little bit simplistic. The IDRs, you can call them securities, you can call them contractual provisions to an increasing take of the cash flow as certain target distribution thresholds are set forth in the partnership agreement. They're um, usually granted to sponsors in exchange for the sponsors agreeing to take subordinated units at the IPO. It's a trade-off, you get the upside, but you also have to take some of the downside. And they are sold as an incentive for the general partner to go out and make accretive acquisitions or otherwise build the business in such a way that distributions are increased. So how do they work? And that's on page 14. A minimum quarterly distribution is set at the IPO based on the expected yield of the security at the time of pricing or time of launch of the IPO. So if you expect a $20 IPO price and you expect a 5% yield, then you expect a $1 distribution per year, and in any quarter, that's a $0.25 cent distribution. So you set that as the minimum quarterly distribution. That does not mean that the MLP is required to distribute that amount, but it means until the common have received the $0.25, cents, nobody else receives anything. The subordinated units then get the next <clears throat> $0.25, cents, and the IDRs kick in above that in increasing sharing ratios with the unit holders uh, from 15 to 25 to 50 percent. There are variations uh, on that upstream MLPs that have IDRs typically cap, cap out at 25 percent. So there are various methods of simplifications that we're going to talk about, and I'll give a, a little background and Ray will go through a number of the case studies. But the first one is a temporary fix, a temporary suspension or reduction in the IDRs generally to facilitate one transaction. It will be time limited and dollar limited. Number two is a reset pursuant to a specific mechanism in the limited partnership agreement. It is rarely used, but it is available for people to use. <clears throat> the third are negotiated IDR modifications where the sponsor and the conflicts committee negotiate some sort of arrangement to modify existing IDRs. They're not eliminating them generally, and they're not merging a company out of existence. They're just changing the partnership agreement provision on how cash gets distributed. Number four is where the IDRs are exchanged for common units. That's the basic transaction. There can be variations on that. Five is a tuck-in merger of the general partner, and Ray was alluding to this, um, when a general partner becomes a subsidiary of the MLP. And number six, which is probably the most frequent, is where a corporate sponsor, a private equity sponsor, buys back the MLP, or where a parent MLP that is created, a subsidiary MLP, buys back that MLP. In the second instance, the IDRs may remain <coughs> um, outstanding, you know, certainly at the parent level. So the, the first method are, is this temporary fix. Um, it is to make uh, an acquisition accretive by uh, the sponsor agreeing to forego some of the distributions on the incentive distribution rights. Conflicts committee approval is usually obtained for these temporary fixes, even though it is a unilateral give by the sponsor, and that's because it is done in connection with a drop down as part of the consideration for uh, the conflicts committee to approve the transaction. No unit holder vote is necessary in these cases. Ray, you want to talk about Sure, and, and so lots of examples of this, and this could be a drop down, could be an acquisition, um, and basically, why is there a GDP give back? Because when you think about it, okay, MLP is going to make this acquisition, it's 100% funded down at the LP level, and GP picks up all the benefits. 
So the GP can step in and say, okay, to make this a little bit better for the LP, I'm going to give something up, I'll give some cash back that I otherwise would be entitled to, and that makes the transaction better for the LP. A lot of times we see it because they say, all right, it's a competitive situation in order for us to win the transaction and for it to be beneficial to the LPs, we can give something up as the GP. Effectively, to me, it's almost as if the GP is helping out in the financing. Lots of examples, page 17, um, DCP recently when they brought in DCP midstream from up top said, uh, here's, here's one form of give back. Uh, I'm not going to give you any cash, but as long as I, I will support the LPs, um, so the, the distribution coverage. So if the distribution coverage falls below one times, I will support through my GP give back $100 million per year um, to get that uh, coverage ratio back up. Uh, Tesoro on the Whiting acquisition said I will waive $100 million for the next two years. That's a specific GP give back. Energy Transfer did something uh, similar, $60 million for two years for the Sunoco deal. Um, look down at Suncoke, one year deferral payment for the IDRs. And then on Targa, they staged it and said, all right, 37 and a half, then 25, then 10, then five, really to help manage out the cash flows to the LP. So there's endless combinations you can do on this, and but effectively the way we see it is um, the, the GP is helping out in the overall um, financing that the LP is doing because if there were no GP give back, the LP does 100% of the financing and the GP takes back all of the benefit without having to pay out anything really. And most of these examples are dollar amounts that are determined at the time of the uh, a, a transaction and they're time limited um, and people are working off of the projections to determine accretion based on the projections. DCP midstream is a little bit different where, as I understand it, they actually have to achieve a particular target, not just uh, project that they will be able to do so. On page 18, we go to this IDR reset mechanism that's in limited partnership agreements. Um, the, the first one, I think, was uh, coincidentally DCP midstream in 2005, and that shows that the high cost of capital attributable to IDRs was identified as a, as a real issue even um, 11 years ago at the end of 2005. <clears throat> and so the, the bankers and lawyers came up with this um, provision that gave the general partner the option that it, had, uh, that it could exercise without any fiduciary duty concerns to reset the IDRs as long as it had been in the top splits for four quarters. And what it, there were two parts to this reset. The first is that it gives back its old IDRs to the partnership, then they're then canceled, in exchange for common units and maybe GP units that pay out uh, a cash distribution equivalent to the IDRs that they just gave back. So if the IDRs were paying $20 million, they will get common units that are currently paying $20 million. The second part of the transaction is the resetting of the IDRs with a new minimum quarterly distribution being the top split that was being paid at the time of the IDR reset, and then the target distribution levels are set at 15, 25, and 50 percent above that. Um, as far as I know, it's been used once, and Ray's going to talk about it. It's possible there's another one, but this is the one. This is the only one we could find. Uh, it was back in 2011. It was EV Energy Partners, um, where the GP, as Josh mentioned, gave up. So the give get here is the GP gives up the IDR levels that were set at the IPO. In exchange for that, the GP received Class B units that were convertible one to one into common units um, one year later. And it was the cash equivalent to the way the partnership agreements are written are the look back to the two, past two quarters, what the LPs were given on a cash basis then, and you get the equivalent number of, of shares on a yield basis. What did that all mean? If you go to the bottom of page uh, 19, on the left-hand side was the original IPO um, IDR tiers. Uh, so the MQD was at 40 cents. The, as, as Josh mentioned, EV was into the 50% tier, or, and um, or the, I guess it's into fifty percent here, and um, uh, had been paying out roughly the 
which you see on the right-hand side, 76 cents. So that became the new MQD, and then the distributions uh, schedule was up from there um, on how that was on how that was structured. On page 20, a little bit of a different variation. So uh, EV was exactly to the partnership agreement. Golar did something a little bit different where they said, I'm going to reset. So GP will give up the IDRs that were set at the IPO. In exchange, they'll receive units. But in this case, it was, I will give you deferred units or earnout units, 50% of which will be paid if you continue to pay the new MQD for the next four quarters. The other 50% will be given if you, for the four quarters after that, give the MQD. So it's a little bit of a variation, a little bit more protection to the LP holders um, in, in this case. So a modification, that's not how the partnership agreement read. And if you go to page 21, um, uh, on NISCA, that was a, a, a totally different way of IDR modification. Here, um, the GP eliminated all of the subunits and the original IDR tiers. So the GP gives up not only the IDR tiers, but also the, all of the subordinating units, which hadn't, I think at the time, had not been being, had not been paid. Um, and they said, all right, in exchange for that, which was a significant ownership of the, uh, of, of NISCA, uh, in exchange for that, the GP would receive immediately that top tier after the MQD. So if you look at the bottom right-hand side of the page, the MQD was 35 cents and the top tier was 52 cents when they got into the 50% tier. They exchanged it into a set MQD at 35 cents and every dollar above that is in the 50% tier. Now that's very beneficial to the GP if they can get there. And what they gave up for that though was all the subordinated units are completely gone. So that effectively, if you count the subunits as part of the ownership, their ownership went from 74.9% down to 50.3%. So again, another modification. Um, and, and this was a pretty big give up by the GP and you can see that market reaction on the bottom left-hand side of the page. So now we move to method four, exchange of IDRs for common units. Um, key examples here, which Ray will go through, are PAGP and, and Williams. And this, there, there can be bells and whistles associated with this transaction, but basically it's coming up with an exchange ratio for the IDRs in exchange for common units. It is clearly a conflict transaction. It goes to the conflicts committee uh, who negotiates the exchange ratio. The conflicts can, uh, unit holder approval is not required because there's no limit in partnership agreements on the ability of partnerships to issue common units. It's not like a corporation where there's a concept of authorized capital and the New York Stock Exchange limit on the issuance of shares uh, in a private placement um, in excess of 20% doesn't exist for limited partnerships. If the sponsor is a corporation, sometimes there can be a vote, and there was in PAGP, but that was a little bit of a special circumstance. Ray, you want to take us through? Sure. And on um, page 23, Williams, uh, so this was early this year, uh, WMB, WPZ announced that um, effectively they were taking out the IDRs and the GP, the economic GP interest. So W. PZ bought out WMB's IDRs and GP interests. And in association with this, they announced a pipe deal, um, uh, private investment and public equity deal, um, and, and subsequent WMB uh, stock issuance, and a distribution cut. Now, that was all blended together to achieve the following. One, it helped out on the cost of capital, basically for both WPZ and WMB. Uh, two, from a WPZ perspective, they were able to, having been in a position of a sub one times coverage, announce that, hey, I'm coming out of this with a coverage ratio of roughly 1.2 times, growth at five to 7%, which the growth was, was challenged before, and 
uh, no new equity issuance for until 2020 and beyond. So I'm taking myself out of the need to do financings, and that was pretty well received by the marketplace, if you can see on the upper right-hand side uh, from that transaction. Similarly, um, on the next page, on 24, um, Plains in July of 2016 did something similar. They uh, acquired, PAA acquired the IDRs and uh, from PAGP. PAGP still is left outstanding. Uh, they also announced a distribution cut, um, and effectively, uh, this was done to lower cost of capital, similar to to Williams. Uh, it was a simplified structure and provided greater unit uh, liquidity. And you can see, uh, effectively, on the right hand side of the page favorable reaction in the marketplace, both uh, on the PAA and PAGP side. So those are kind of examples of IDRs for units and recent examples. Um, the method five is this, what uh, Josh and I both mentioned before, the tuck-in merger to general partners, where uh, the MLP buys back its general partner. Uh, this was back in 2010, kind of the simplification uh, method. Um, and generally was in that 2009, 2010 timeframe. Um, some of these companies are no longer, uh, but uh, some are very prominent, such as Enterprise, Buckeye, and Magellan. And then we kind of land on corporate buy-ins or the parent acquisition of the MLPs. We've seen a lot of those recently. Can be for, this is essentially where um, whomever it is, the corporate sponsor or some sponsors pulling back uh, the MLP back into the overall organization. Um, why? It's generally because whatever happened, the MLP is not achieving its initial goals. So that could be it's not trading the way we thought it was going to trade, it's got too high a cost of capital, it's over levered. As I look towards the projections, I'm not happy with what I see, so I'm going to take it in. Um, I want more liquidity. I want a simplified corporate structure. So all of these have been cited in, in, uh, in numerous examples. Uh, and the examples are numerous. Um, on page 27, um, you know, you can, you can step back and do the old um, Enterprise and Duncan Energy Partners or Pioneer and Pioneer Southwest, or more recently, Energy, Enbridge Energy Partners Midcoast, or OCI, OCIP, or One Oak, or Transocean, and so uh, quite, quite prevalent in, um, in, in, in this. And again, for all the reasons that, that were mentioned, whether it's leverage, outlook, growth, not happy with where it's trading. Um, and let's let's go through a couple of uh, of examples. We'll go through Transocean. So Transocean Corp bought in Transocean Partners. It was done all stock, stock for units. Uh, this was back in August of 2018. Interesting for this, this actually did require a vote. It required a majority of the unaffiliated. Uh, to get this transaction done, and it was finally approved at a 1.2 times exchange ratio. Uh, they actually had a vote, ended up um, bumping the exchange ratio uh, a tad from the original to, in order to get the transaction done. The rationale was cost saving, simplified, simplified capital structure, um, and effectively, Rig P, Transocean Partners, wasn't really performing. It was trading at a 13.3% yield, and from their investor presentation, they just said, look, it's not performed as a growth-oriented yield company as, as the way we had wanted it to perform. Um, and another example that everyone's familiar with is back in 2014 when Kinder Morgan bought in KMP, KMR, and EPB. So all of the um, underlying uh, uh, securities and MLPs they bought in. Um, that was a stock for unit transaction. The transaction rationale was to simplify the structure, to lower the cost of capital. There was significant income tax savings up top at the C Corp. There were some tax payments back at, down at the MLPs and this broader pool of capital to, to the C Corp. So it was uh, rationale on the, on the KMI side. So we've gone through kind of six different methods and things that are trending more in the MLP simplification. We get a lot of questions from outside investors saying, 
you know, is the MLP market dead? Is it is it dying? Is it all kind of going away? We don't think so. Um, our equity analyst, Tim Schneider, says, look, um, we, we see CapEx in North America having been at $65 billion a year down to 20 or so, but um, so, so there's more value of things in the ground. There's not, there's not going to be as much growth, so we can't quite count on that, but that just dials down expectations. So yes, the Alarian yield might be up a bit, but if my growth expectations were back in 2014 double digits, Maybe they're now more three to seven percent, but if I've got a seven percent yield and three to seven percent growth, I'm ten to fourteen percent. I'll take that as an investment. It's not going away. So we don't think it, it goes away. As you can see on page thirty, left hand side of the page, really outperformance all the way from you know oh seven to the beginning of two thousand fifteen. Um, the Alarian outperformed the S and P and. The, when we talk to companies, there's still growth, there's still good on distributions, MLPs do have access to capital, they can exist without the IDRs and the GP structure, and we are now seeing kind of shoots of spring or what have you of uh, MLPs being filed and we could see more IPOs in 2017. So we think the market is still healthy, it's just a little bit different from where it was two, three years ago. I'm going to turn it over to Mike Bresson to talk about some of the tax consequences of these simplifications. Okay, these are all uh, transactions that are undertaken for a very similar purpose, but the uh, the tax details can depend a lot on the particular type of transaction that you that you selected. So you got to start with is are we talking about a one party deal or a two party deal? Is the MLP just making some change unilaterally with its unit holders? Or is it a two-party deal where you're doing some sort sort of a combination, and then you need to know, well, am I do I have a partnership combining with a partnership, or a corporation combining with a corporation, or is it or is it a partnership and corporation mixing together? All that has a big effect on the tax consequences. Uh, is the consideration equity? Is the consideration uh, cash, or some sort of combination? Um, uh, and, and what what are were the specific details of, of the type of equity that can affect the uh, the, the tax consequences significantly? And then, uh, you know, one of the tax lawyer's favorite points because it confuses the heck of it out of everybody is the effect of, uh, of debt that is inside a partnership MLP because there, there's a lot of um, – uh, the, 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 a nice thing about debt inside an MLP is that uh, it can actually produce tax bases to, to, the, uh, to the unit holders so they can make take deductions or get distributions in excess of their original investments. That's the good part. The bad part can be when you go to do a transaction and some of that debt that was allocated to you now gets allocated away from you. That can have tax consequences that to you then in a in a transaction. So we're going to roll through quickly. I'm going to categorize the way tax lawyers think about some of the the, the transactional alternatives. The the unilateral IDR give back is very simple to uh, to, to think about. There's really not much of a change. The uh, the um, uh, uh, sponsors doing away without IDRs, uh, doing without the IDR distributions uh, for a while to some extent. So they're getting less cash, and they usually get a, a if they're a partnership, they're getting a gross income allocation equal to that distribution. So if the uh, MLP gets to keep all that cash, then all the all the unit holders are going to have more income allocated to them because that cash and that gross income is not going out to, to the sponsor anymore. Corporate MLP, it's, it's, it's a little uh, uh, simpler. You think of it in terms of uh, so is the corporate uh, corporate MLP paying a, a taxable dividend or are they paying a, a return of capital distribution? If you're paying less out to the um, uh, sponsor in the way of uh, earnings and profits, then you have, may have more potential for earnings and profits distributions to, uh, to unit holders, so more dividend income, less tax-free return of capital. So, I'm going to lump in uh, several transactions uh, on, on uh, this slide, slide uh, 34. Um, uh, so uh, an IDR reset transaction, a swap of uh, IDRs for common units, or just an, a negotiated change in, in, the, in the terms of the IDRs. They, they're all generally at a high level non-taxable transactions. Uh, the details are going to vary depending upon the specific transaction that you're doing. The types of issues to, uh, uh, that, that, that always come up are, are number one, you've got the unit holders that's held their units for a long time, so they've 
received distribution, tax-free distributions or loss allocations that exceeded their original purchase price, then they might have continued to receive tax-free distributions or losses based on debt that's, uh, basis that's provided by debt. So when you do an IDR for unit swap, that is going to naturally take some debt away from the existing units to go to the new units that are be issue, being issued at the sponsor in exchange for the IDRs. And so if you, you're a longtime holder, you've got potentially a debt shift that's going to, that's going to create some gain to you just by virtue of the, uh, of the exchange. And there's also some issues for, for, for all unit holders, um, uh, uh, whether the, the rules that trigger um, uh, uh, ordinary income uh, on the disposition of a unit for, for depreciation recapture. Under some circumstances, you might worry about whether that, that triggers gain, although if you do a capital account rebooking, you, um, uh, you, you don't really have to worry about that uh, issue. And then a uh, kind of a mind-bending aspect of these deals is that they, uh, they can affect adversely the tax shield of the unit holders going forward. Uh, the reasons for that is com are complex. For one thing, just to take an example of, think about IDRs being swapped for units Again, the tax lawyers don't allocate debt to IDRs. So if you're giving units to the sponsor in exchange for the IDRs, and a bunch of the existing debt is going to be allocated over to, to the uh, to the IDRs, and those units are going to be uh, the former IDR holder. Those units are going to be getting net income allocations, where the IDRs used to be getting gross income allocations. And then when you rebook everybody's capital accounts to determine how they're going to do allocations back and forth to each other to make sure that nobody shifts the burdens of built-in gains. To the other uh, to, to the other equity holders, that is naturally going to cause more income to be allocated, more net remedial income to be allocated to the unit holders. So there's an adverse tax shield effect on the on the unit holders going forward. Corporate MLP, it's a lot it's a lot simpler because you're just doing a, a corporate recapitalization. That's generally going to be a, a tax free transaction. You don't have to worry about these tax shield effects. Um, uh, so we might be, uh, if we're doing a two-party transaction, uh, you know, a GP, a, a GP and, this, and this MLP subsidiary are combining, that might be a partnership, partnership transaction, it might be a corporation, corporation transaction. I'll skip down to the bottom, corporation, corporation, corporation transactions, you know, that's just like your good old corporate M&A, there's a lot of different ways to do it, do a tax-free corporate transaction. In the, uh, in the combining two partnership uh, uh, world, you know, MLPs can merge tax-free just the, the same way as corporations can. That's usually done on, on a should opinion, a tax council. We'll, we'll talk more about tax opinions when, when we talk about the process, you know, the cash consideration or liability shift, that's gonna be, that's gonna be carved out of the um, uh, uh, tax opinion. And if you are uh, achieving basically an, an IDR for unit swap through doing an M&A transaction, you know, the, um, uh, the MLP acquiring its GP or vice versa, you're gonna have similar tax shield effects going forward. Uh, if a partnership acquires this corporate sponsor, that's easy to do tax-free. You're issuing units to bring the corporation underneath. That's going to hurt the tax shield of the unit holders going forward because you just um, uh, uh, divided up the deductions among a greater pie of unit holders, and uh, you don't have any new deductions because your new asset is, is stock of a corporation. There's a, a technical issue there because the partnership own stock of a corporation, they own units in the partnership, they own stock of a corporation, and so you, you've got to deal with some uh, some tax issues that, that that raises about whether gains should be triggered, which people have successfully managed. If a, uh, uh, if, if a corporate sponsor acquires a, a partnership MLP, uh, you know, think like the KMI uh, transaction where it was acquiring a couple of its MLPs, um, uh, there, there's a lot of interesting considerations to consider, and there's been, uh, 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 you know, some controversy about these issues. Uh, if if, if uh, the corporation is paying cash consideration, that's going to be taxable. If they're paying equity consideration, that could be done as a tax-free deal. So far, it's always been done as a uh, uh, as a taxable deal. And when we look at the sponsor sponsor considerations, you, you start to see why that's the case. Um, a tax-free transaction gives the sponsor a, a, usually a low carryover basis and the underlying assets of the MLP is buying in. But if you do a taxable transaction, then, uh, then, then you can get the step up and you, you know, thinking about why the transaction would be taxable. If a corporation is acquiring 
unincorporated assets. That's generally a taxable transaction, unless it's a so-called 351 transaction where where um, uh, the folks that have assets in motion in the corporation wind up owning 80% of the stock. So it has to be a big transaction or a specially structured transaction to be a, a tax-free transaction. That's generally going to be a taxable transaction. So a corporation issues its stock to buy an MLP units. You're usually going to assume that's going to be a, 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 a taxable transaction unless special structuring is done to make it into a tax-free transaction. So on the, on the unit holder side, uh, there, there's good things for the unit holders about having a tax-free transaction. First of all, you don't have to pay tax uh, uh, today. You can kick the can down the road, and if you get if you get stock tax-free, then uh, and you hold that stock for at least a year, then you you might have had a bunch of ordinary income recapture in your units. You can sell that stock, and it's all all capital gain uh, income. Or if you um, uh, just were planning to hold on to those units, uh, they're such a great investment. You hold them until you die. You get a step up in basis for your heirs. So if, if that's your plan, is it is unwelcome to hear that you're about to have a taxable transaction where you're going to recognize um, uh, uh, all of that gain. And so the consequences of a taxable transaction, as I was previewing, you've got to pay a bunch of tax. So if there's um, uh, cash consideration being provided as part of the deal. You got to worry about whether you're getting enough considered cash consideration to pay all all the tax you're you're going to pay, or if you don't offer any cash consideration of the deal at all, then you've got to think about the unit holders are going to be selling off the units or otherwise coming up with with, with cash to pay the tax. Um, uh, so, so 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 that 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 you know all those adverse effects to the to the unit holders have to be taken into account. One good one good thing for the unit holders is that. They will be equity holders going forward in, in the acquire, and so they will partake of a portion of the, of the benefit of that, uh, of that step up. Before we get to the process issues, I'm going to read the number that you need to get your CLE credits. I'll specifically read the sentence I'm told to read. All attorneys participating by a webinar must note this number on their affirmation form to earn the appropriate number of CLE credits. The number is 58612. 58612. Now I'm going to talk about process for a little bit. MLPs, as I think everybody knows, are governed a little bit differently than corporations. If the partnership agreement was were silent on the subject or said that a partnership was governed like a corporation, then the duties of the directors and the general partner would track that of the uh, corporate of corporate directors and, and companies. But in fact, MLP partnership agreements take advantage of the Delaware statute, which allows all fiduciary duties to be eliminated and replaced with what we call, some of us call contractual fiduciary-like duties that impose their own duties on the part of directors, officers, and the general partner. The typical duty imposed by these partnership agreements is for these actors to act in good faith, sometimes the partnership agreement will say their duty is not to act in bad faith. And good faith or bad faith are defined. And good faith is typically defined as a subjective belief that the actor, belief, subjective belief of the actor that the action is or not adverse to the best interests of the partnership. And any action taken in good faith, meaning the directors had that belief, will be conclusively deemed fair and not subject to challenge by a plaintiff. There are uh, other ways to challenge a transaction, but not on that. Um, also, if directors take an action on reliance on an opinion of legal counsel or a fairness opinion from an investment banker, and the directors believe that the opinion giver is competent to render that opinion, then any action they take in reliance on that opinion is conclusively presumed to have been taken in good faith. So a fairness opinion gets a committee very far. Of course, a fairness opinion doesn't cover all aspects of fairness. It covers financial fairness, but it gets directors a long way down the road of approving a transaction. So conflicts of interest, so that's the, that's the basic fiduciary duty. Now there's the conflict of interest overlay 
on that. And any time you do one of these restructurings, there is a conflict of interest. The sponsor who controls the entity is proposing a transaction by which it believes it will benefit. And if it were to make the decisions unilaterally, you would worry about, um, about whether this transaction were fair or had received the, the proper vetting. So there are four ways of resolving a conflict of interest. And uh, the, the first one here on page 41 is approval by the conflicts committee, which is used in the vast majority of these situations. Number two is approval by the public unit holders. And that is used whenever a vote is required and sometimes uh, when it's not required by the partnership agreement. And three and four are when the boards of directors decide that they will um, make the decision themselves on the fairness and reasonableness of the transaction or on the market terms of the transaction. In order for a decision of the conflicts committee to constitute what we call special approval, the type of approval that will immunize uh, the decision from attack, like, like a business judgment decision would immunize a decision from attack. The committee must be comprised solely of independent members. The partnership agreement spells forth what independence means. It refers to the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ requirements and also provides that the uh, the directors can't own securities in the parent. And it may be no securities, it may be de minimis securities, but it will set forth what those requirements are. In addition, there are judicial decisions uh, strongly advising that directors um, not have very close social ties or other economic ties to management or the sponsor. Those are typically in the corporate context, but practitioners advise MLP committees to follow the case law in that case. How, how does this work? So the sponsor has a proposal, brings it to the MLP board, which is the board at the general partner level. The board then uh, forms a conflicts committee, or it may be a standing conflicts committee, and refers the matter to the committee for evaluation, negotiation, and recommendation to the full board on a course of action. The committee then meets, they hire their lawyers, they hire their investment bankers. A diligence process is begun at which management makes its case for the value of the IDRs that will be exchanged, and there's negotiation for several weeks. Now, when I'm re representing directors I, uh, on a committee, I say before you decide to dive into what the appropriate exchange ratio is, you first have to decide that this is a transaction that makes sense for the partnership or the unit holders. Does it make sense to do anything at all? And if it does make sense, is this the right transaction? You have to think about alternate transactions even if they're not put on the table, but if you believe that some other avenue is worth exploring, then you should speak up to the sponsor with that. Ray's gonna talk a little bit about valuation considerations. So we've listed out some things on page 44 of just some of the things that the banker will do in terms of valuation, just kind of cash flow, peer company analysis, precedent transactions, exchange ratio or premiums paid analysis, if appropriate. The bottom line is it's whatever that MLP is paying, is that a fair price? The, the, a lot of times directors will say, well, what's the accretion, what's that? Yes, the market's focused on accretion, but technically that's not really part of the fairness opinion. It's what's the value being paid. Now, we always run the accretion dilution analysis because it's an interesting thing to know, um, but it's not technically necessary. We could be in, you, you can have situations where something's fair, where it's actually dilutive. Because if I'm acquiring an asset that's lowering my risk overall of the company and getting me to a lower cost of capital, theoretically, then that could be dilutive. And we see it a lot in corporate transactions. We don't see it as much in MLP transactions. So um, technically, from a, from a fairness perspective, you could, fa you could have a deal that's fair that is dilutive. But I will tell you, 90 plus percent of the time, these transactions are accretive in addition to being there. 
Mike's going to talk a little bit about tax opinions as a condition to close. Okay, so, so at least for the 30 years I've been practicing, and I think for much longer, when you do a tax-free deal, people want the certainty that they're or a good feeling about the fact that the deal is actually going to be tax-free. So you condition closing upon the an opinion of tax counsel that the uh, that the transaction is in fact uh, tax-free. In the MLP space, that's typically a, a should-level opinion. You know, some deals are done on on will opinions. But the M&A transactions in, in the MLP space typically done on a should opinion, which is a, a very high level of tax opinion, but not, not the highest level of tax opinion. Of course, your trade-off is that if you um, uh, is that by getting that opinion, you know that you're not going to close the deal unless you've got the tax treatment that you thought you were you're bargaining for. The bad thing is that uh, if you get down to the end and you don't get the opinion, then you can then then you can lose your deal. And so that's a um, uh, Sounds kind of boring and esoteric until the failure to get a tax opinion blows up a deal, which is what we had happen in the um, uh, the uh, ETE WMB transaction. So it's a, it's a, it was an interesting and novel structure where uh, ETE, ETE and MLP was setting up a corporation that was going to acquire Williams, and then Williams was going to drop uh, uh, all the Williams assets were going to be dropped into ETE. So another one of these circular types of structures, which is what uh, eventually led to some tax problems. Closing was conditioned on opinions of a particular designated uh, uh, law firm that, that uh, both those transactions would be uh, tax-free. And uh, all was well at the time of signing, but, but at some point in the process, the, uh, that designated law firm said, we are actually not able to provide that closing opinion. So, of course, litigation uh, uh, ensued in the Delaware Chancery Court. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the judge said that uh, that designated law firm was made the sole arbiter of whether that opinion could be provided or not, and that law firm said no. The court asked, was, the, was that law firm acting in good faith, try using its, exercising its legal judgment, or was it just a, a, a shield for its client who clearly wanted to walk the deal at that point, and the, the judge thought they were acting in, in, in good faith? And, and the judge found that um, even though the um, uh, uh, ETE had a, had a duty to, to use commercially re reasonable efforts to get the tax opinion, that uh, uh, if the law firm said it couldn't give the opinion, it couldn't give the opinion, so uh, uh, so no deal, so the transaction did not close. It's up on appeal before the uh, Delaware Supreme Court right now, The uh, uh, with, with Williams trying to refocus the court on uh, on not so much the uh, the, the good faith of, of, of the law firm, but on the, the failure of, uh, of the um, uh, of ETE to uh, use its uh, commercially reasonable efforts to get the opinion. And so after after you have a, a, a blow up like that, what do you do? How do you think about uh, d doing deals in the future? There's um, uh, uh, and, and, and folks have taken a variety of approaches from business as usual. We're going to continue having our, our regular old closing condition, maybe uh, allowing another firm to give the tax opinion if um, uh, if, if the designated firm can't. Um, have the opinion of signing rather than a closing, which takes a little risk on what can happen between signing and closing, but, but you know that it's not going to blow up your deal if, if you've got the opinion of signing. And some folks are saying, okay, forget the tax opinion. This is what we hope for, and we're going to do the deal, and we don't need an opinion. And you can see examples there in your materials of folks that have taken those various approaches. I would note that obtaining a tax opinion at signing is like obtaining a fairness opinion at signing. It's rare to get a breakdown of a fairness opinion at court. I'll briefly go through the conflicts committee approval process. On page 48, the, once the committee has, has done all this, it's gotten its opinion, it's negotiated the contract, it's gotten the, um, any, the fairness opinion as well, they approve the transaction. They refer it to the full board of directors, the MLP. That board approves it. Sponsor board typically would approve it unless it's a small deal to the sponsor and it doesn't need board approval there. And then the agreement is executed. Occasionally, unit holder approval will be required, typically in the context of a merger, the non-surviving entity you will need a vote. That vote um, is typically just a majority of the common units assuming that the subordinated units have converted. And if it's just common units, the, the, under the partnership agreement, the sponsor gets to vote its common units. The entity issuing the units um, in exchange for the IDRs does not typically need a vote. 
The acquirer does not need a vote unless it's a corporation issuing more than 20% of its outstanding stock. Occasionally, you'll see something called neutralized voting where it's um, where the majority of the public have to vote on the transaction. That will happen if the company is in subordination or if the conflicts committee successfully negotiates for this neutralized voting. They often want this because it gives a little more protection, they feel, to themselves if the public has ratified the deal. <coughs> um, that usually does not obtain, usually sponsors push back pretty heavily on a um, neutralized voting request. The best practices are for a conflicts committee and for the sponsor are to be very clear what the scope of work for the conflicts committee is and for the directors of the conflicts committee to really understand their assignment. Number two is to hire competent advisors who are independent of the sponsor and a lot of effort goes into determining that independence because if there's a lack of independence, that gives plaintiffs an argument to attack the entire transaction. And a lot of deals have been attacked on that basis. Three is that the directors uh, have all the information they need to make an informed decision that's no different from any practice at, uh, at the corporate level. Um, but it's basically the duty of care, which is not necessary. So th the duty of care is not spelled out in the partnership agreement. The processes that a complex committee has, has to file uh, on this type of transaction are not specified, but people uh, adopt best practices that would be adopted by a corporate board in similar circumstances, believing, and I think correctly, that courts expect that type of uh, behavior. Deliberation, it's important that it not be a rushed, rubber-stamped process and the directors take the time, just typically a few weeks, sometimes more, to get up to speed on the company, the valuation, any diligence issues, and negotiate the transaction. The committee has to have the ability to say no to the transaction, ability to negotiate the transaction. Record keeping is an important part of keeping yourself in good shape if litigation comes. If this is a transaction requiring a unit holder vote, then you'll have to go to the SEC. If it's a transaction involving the issuance of securities, say in a merger, share merger, then you're also going to go to the SEC and get your documents clear. And on page 54 is a little bit of a timeline. Typically, it'll take several weeks to negotiate a merger agreement, several more weeks to file the registration statement or the proxy statement. Depending on the level of SEC review, might be no review, which you'll find out in a week or 10 days. Could be a very brief review. There could be a full review, not just of the uh, disclosure document, but of the 1934 Act reports as well. Once you're cleared to mail, you've got about 30 days that you've got to give the unit holders to consider how they want to vote. And you will typically, in the MLP world, engage a proxy solicitor because of the thinly traded nature of the securities, a lot are held by retail investors or on swap or in, in other ways that don't really lead to um, high participation. Finally, if the deal is a three transaction where unit holders are getting cash for all or a portion of their interests, the SEC requires considerably more disclosure and uh, often will give a more detailed review. And with that, we are concluded. And I don't know, Natalie, if we have any questions. We don't have any questions from the phone, any questions from the room. With that, thank you all for uh, listening in.